right. I basically I sort of for this week's activity I want to talk today generically about tissues and what they are, and then Thursday more specifically on the effects. So I, I have so this is going to be more anatomy physiology type slides, and then next time we'll look more at more specific and and because there's a fair amount of terminology, some of which uh, I talked to Dr. Buxton yesterday. I think he he, he did some of that in presentation wise uh, last week, but you know, that I think that's important as well. So that's kind of where we are with what, with what we're starting with today. So. Without any further ado, and I, you see I've loaded a whole slew of these are the PowerPoints I've been using for I don't know how many the last umpteen years. Now, although this is an updated edition for anatomy and physiology, and we start with tissues. So when they use the term tissue anatomically, it's an accumulation of cells that are similar. And sometimes they're, and then you make the transition from it to anatomically speaking, from a tissue to an organ, now you have groups of tissues that function together for a particular purpose. So that, I mean, that's sort of the anatomy. So we hear, you hear the term tissue a lot. So we look, at least from a radiation perspective and the effects on cells. And it's interesting, as I, as I was reviewing the material, the first difference that struck me is that there's a whole different set of effects from radiation impact on cells and tissues than there are from like cancer chemotherapy. That there's similarities, but there's definitely distinctions because some of the some of the tissues that are affected radiation wise are not necessarily as rapidly affected uh, chemotherapy wise and vice versa. So it's kind of interesting. So, for instance, I, I will, to frame it this way, I, I, the cancer that I have was, have been diagnosed with and continue to I don't struggle with it now. Okay, but I mean, for five years ago, it's bladder cancer, cigarettes, and uh, that would not be a mean itself to either radiation or chemicals because if you anatomically, the bladder is surrounded by a giant muscle, big sac, and muscle is a barrier, and muscle and X rays don't penetrate that. So where do they use chemicals? You have to put them in directly. You can't even get them to the bloodstream; it just doesn't work. So it's kind of interesting. So there's a certain anatomical understanding of things that, that are going to affect. And then if you go back and look at some of the stuff that's in your textbook or just generically that's available online. Now, radiation has changed so much with the sophistication of the technology that you can really understand the science of it, both the focusing of it directly on areas and the dosing of it with the select, with, you know, with, with how sensitive and improved and technologically advanced the instrumentation is, which is which is really fascinatingly different to what to what the way it used to be done. Like for instance, I mean, we saw these things that were weird. They used to they tell you about something called a linear accelerator. Is that ringing a bell? Okay. Years ago, back. Before I started in practice, and right around, still using it at the time I started in practice, they, when somebody came into their GP's office, their general practitioner or family doc, in the old days, their general practitioner, like with a ward or something like that, they'd send them up to the hospital and do, and, and they have a device called the linear accelerator, which was a precursor to significant radiation techniques, and they blast the ward wherever it was on their skin. And I used to get stuff treating those things with burns, and they were just, they were awful because they were so, it, it got rid of the wart, but it, it did a tremendous amount of damage to the skin in that context. So now, and there's a, we don't, you just don't do that anymore. It's not part of, it's not something that should be done, whether or not someone is still doing it, I don't know. So that's sort of the, the jumping off. And this is, I'm going to be going through the slides relatively rapidly in an effort to, Acquaint you, you know, some of the terminology and what goes on. So tissues, groups of cells, similar in function. The big player from a radiation perspective here, epithelial tissues. A lesser player, connective tissues. Epithelial tissues are much more directly impacted because they replicate so rapidly. 
they are the ones that, and they are the ones that when they describe things that are acutely sensitive or things that are limitedly sensitive or in ones that develop or ones that have delayed sensitivity in the sense that you don't see the problems until after you know, a considerable time interval, epithelial tissues are the ones that are typically acutely sensitive. And you know, I'm going to show you some of the areas that are part of that and just to understand what's going on with it. Connective tissues, by and large, don't have, uh, they're very, very densely packed, as you will see. And the distinction is just how much vasculature they have. Because blood vessels and the availability of oxygen are significant factors in how the tissues are impacted by exposure to radiation, either by intent or inadvertent. And then you get things like muscle and nerve tissue, which really are comparatively, they don't replicate a great deal. Connective tissues replicate, some do, some do not. We'll look at those. And then muscle and nervous tissue, which really do not very much. And they're relatively insulated from the effects of radiation. And they're just showing you where they're located. And, and this is how you look at, I mean, it gives you an idea. Very useful micrographs that show you how elaborate they, you know, these tissues are. And so they're using the comparison of transmission, a transmission micrograph or electron microscope basically kind of gives you the inner amounts that are there. Where scanning kind of gives you a three-dimensional view. What you're looking at there is something that's called cilia. Familiar with those? No? Yes or no, we'll be fine. Shake head. Have you heard about cilia before? Good. You should have. Okay. So what happens with cilia in cells? Are those are those sub are those going to be damaged by exposure to radiation? And the answer is yes, significantly so. Those are the ones that are the respiratory linings that are there. So to me, the classic example that of, of the patients I treated over the years who had had to have, you know, radiation, let's say for lymphoma or something along those lines, which was for Hodgkin's disease treatment of choice. Okay, sore throat. Because those shed and it damaged those particular, they are very interesting. Let's take a look at them, those lining cells. Those are called cilia. They're really part of the cell. They're not like hairs that stick out. They really are just extensions of the cell that are covered in membrane. And, they, and so these are the ones that we'll look at these lining tissues specifically and the ones that are located, whatever I can get to in the time we have a lot of this morning. So they're on a lot and they're lining. That's what they do. Internal and external surfaces. They're part of glandular tissue. And what makes glandular tissue so sensitive is glandular tissue has a tremendous amount of blood supply. That's what makes glands, glands. <coughs> Most of those glands either go are, are fairly closely exposed to the surface or to the lining or have are invested with a tremendous amount of blood vessels. So then you have, you can affect the blood supply and they, and they have a lot of oxygen and oxygen sort of accelerates the deteriorative process that goes on with, with exposure to radiation. And they have a variety of roles. And some of these don't really impact what you're looking at. And you can go through all these things it's interesting that their blood supply is indirect. So it's kind of what's underneath it. Okay. The close, the, the, generally you'll find them laying very, very close to a very elaborate blood supply. And that's kind of why, even though by definition, they don't have their own blood supply, they, they replicate very, very rapidly. So they're, they're really noted for anything called regeneration. And, and you can take a look at this. So this would be just like a typical line. You see how elongated that cell is down the way you'll take a look at this This is particularly relevant to the digestive area. This is called a brush border. You see how it kind of looks a little fuzzy. If you look at the micrograph that's up there and, I, and this is all blood supply underneath it. So we'll take a look at that. That's gastrointestinal and how they're held together is not a big deal. And, but what they are is they're attached and fairly well with a sheet of proteins called a, bait called a basal membrane or basal lamina, which just means a lining. And overlying, and that overlies really in the area where there's a lot of capillaries, tiny blood vessels that produce a lot of nutrition and particularly a lot of oxygen. 
So and the difference between cancerous cells don't have that containment. They do have a lot of blood supply, but they don't, they aren't well contained comparably and they penetrate and, and things like that. So let's see if I can get you not so much about regeneration, different kinds. And, and the illustrations are good. This is what we see lining a blood vessel. This is what you see lining the exterior of your lung or the exterior of your heart. It's smooth, it's soft. And, and because it's sort of squished down, they give it the name squamous. Okay, where this is both, let's say, inside your mouth and on the exterior of your skin. It's got multiple layers. It's called stratified. And we identify it based on what the outer layer, anatomically, we don't sort of look so much at the base layers, we look at the outer layer. And what happens, the cells start to change as they grow away. Their blood supply is down here. But so the regenerative cells are down here. Those are the ones that are most often affected by radiation. And we, we classify them based on the shapes, et cetera. And, and, and so that's just a look. Okay, lung. So I, I actually cooked up uh, some lung illustrations to show you the vasculature. But these are the kinds of, this is what we see within a lung. Lots and lots of chambers of air that are there. And these lining cells surround an interesting, it's the lung, if you were to look at, if you wanted something that you could, a, a real life representation of what an area of the lung looks like, go into Giant Eagle and get a thing of grapes. It's a grape-like cluster. And those grapes, those little ball-like grapes, are called alveoli. They're circular sacs made up of these cells. So it's almost like when you look at some of these illustrations, like you slice the grapes, put them on a flat like that, and you have chambers with air and sometimes thicker areas and things like that. There's a, a ton of blood vessels surrounding them, and you'll see that in another illustration I'll show to you that I have available. So it's an interesting tissue. It's, it's, it's sort of unique about that when the problem is, is I don't think it, even though it has a lot of oxygen comparatively uh, available to it, I don't know that its response is immediate to radiation. So I don't know how much we necessarily use that. And I'll have to research that vis-a-vis -vis somebody, if you're treating somebody for lung cancer. Lung cancer involves typically those these these flattened cells that are there, and there's other cells that are part of it. This is what glandular cells look like. Okay, and a glandular usually has a tubular cell around a hollow area called the lumen. So the cell makes stuff and it pours it into these little openings, and it's a series of tubes that are there. And, and you see those in the kidney, and the kidney is an interesting area because it's really not very terribly susceptible. It's got the kidney has a big, big boundary, very, very hard and thick of another tissue. It's called a capsule. Stuff can't get through that very easily. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily something that you would look at that. And now these are the ones that are particularly interesting. I think are as susceptible as any. And they're the ones that line. Now the respiratory passageways are different than that deep area inside the lung itself. That deep area inside the lung is one thing, but the paths that lead in through your throat and the start of the bronchial area as it gets into the air passageway before it gets deep inside is different. We see these cells that are elongated and columned and they, and they typically have a couple of things that are significant. They have some type of thing that protrudes out that's really part of the cell, but we call it a protein appendage. And, and kind of how it works is like if you took you took like a, a, a plastic bag and stuck your you know, put a pencil or your finger in it and pushed it out how it could like adhere to your finger. Kind of thing. So it's really, it's, it's something that's approaching from inside the cell that's really part of the cell and surrounded by membrane. It increases surface area or provides a certain function. That's what these guys do. They're very susceptible. So ciliated cells and microvilli, which you're going to see in digestively. And inevitably they have little glandular elements that secrete mucus. Mucus is important, and that too can be damaged. So you, I'm trying to give you an idea of what would be susceptible versus not, as we eventually start to look at what the damage is like, particularly from normal exposure and from overexposure.
So there's lots of different things that are there. So where do you find these? Digestive tract, cold bladder, probably a little more insulated because it's very deep internal, sort of buried under your liver. Glandular ducts, big players. Bronchi, big players. Uterine tubes. I don't think that that's quite as much. I, I cooked up here or included some reproductive slides. I put these all on week three of the power of the blackboard. So you can look at these slides yourselves if you're interested and look through these PowerPoints that are there. And well, the most interesting thing is I was reading through some of the source materials here was the distinction uh, on reproductive cells. I mean, I, I think there's, there's both short-term and long-term implications. I really think the long-term implications are more significant, particularly in the female reproductive, and that's where the uterine tube is. Fine. versus the male where it may have an impact on sperm production, a little less so on egg production. But in general, those two, and when I say long term, that's why we're so cognizant of shielding people with regard to the area of the genitalia. Because that, you're, I think you're, it's the long term effect that you're really concerned with, as opposed to the shorter term or immediate effects. And so, and they're just showing you what some of these look like. And I don't want to really go into that. This, these are the cilia that you can see. Tip trachea would be a perfect example. Those are the glandular elements that are there as well. And these are the ones we see in the mouth. So it's another area that, that's typically immediately impacted. This down here is connective tissue underlying any epithelial cell is a connective tissue that you're going to see the name of shortly called loose areolar connective tissue. It means loose and airy. It's got a lot of space and a lot of blood vessels, and it can fill, and typically it's got space in there. And that space, at least for the most part, filled with oxygen. So it does make it very susceptible to oxygenated nature. And so these linings are particularly affected. We don't we see them in entry areas. So when you're entering before you get cilia, when you enter your nose, you have skin here, the skin's tougher. Because the cells on the outside are dead, and you'll see that in a little bit. Skin's tougher out here, not nearly as much here. These are moist membranes. And the cells shed. And that's the beauty of that when we when we, it's like doing a DNA sample, the way typically you would do that. You should take a swab inside your mouth because you pick up cells that shed all the time. They're cells that are still alive, really. They still have nuclei. And this is the one that we see inside the bladder, ureters, and urethra. That's what affected me. But that mine was indirect because of, it, mine was because of the accumulation of toxic byproducts, carcinogens from the smoke, and they tend to accumulate within the bladder. That's really what the, the focus point is. And so they, and these are the cells, they're called transitional epithelial. So they're not too impacted by radiation. So it's never been something. And glands, there are two different types. And typically they have a lot of blood supply either surrounding them or in close proximity. Endocrine glands like your pituitary gland or your thyroid are surrounded by a nest of blood vessels. So inherently a couple one, they reproduce very rapidly. Glandular tumors are a real problem. The two most common, other than the skin that we see in the form of, of cancers, as well uh, are breast. And it's about the and typically it's not in the fatty cells, but in the glandular cells of the breast. And prostate, and the same thing in the glandular cells of the prostate. They are part of it. Those are exam those are examples of endocrine. They, they, let me rephrase. The prostate is probably more endocrine, and, and to some extent, it may even be exocrine as well. But, but clearly, the breast is more exocrine. It's just got a nest of blood that's very vascular, and the secretion of those particular glands, obviously, with lactation of milk. So it's a, and you can go crazy. So you can take a look here. The blood blood supply surrounds it around these glands that have ducts, but. When it comes to one of these endocrine glands, there's just a capillary bed that surrounds it. That's something I point out when we do anatomy and physiology. It's there.
and then they go into sort of the anatomy of these things, what they look like. This is one of those, those uh, mucus producing glands. So there's a lot of basic anatomy and, and discussion with this here. So I went through that, and I'll just X out of that because I have so many of them. And I go over to here, and this is when we actually start to look at the different tissues that are there. The tissues are not quite as problematic because as you get more organized tissue and more tissue that has differentiated, and that's such an important word, where the cells are no longer actively reproducing or they go into a mode where they're not. It's like, for instance, in the, when I loaded here, I didn't put bone. Okay. The part of the bone is the problem is deep inside. It's called the bone now. Okay. The bone itself is basically just it is, is, is connective tissue filled with calcium. It's just it's, it's very much different. It's got a lot of blood supply. But we rarely see problems associated. It's pretty resistant to radiation. So there's also, and this is what we do in anatomy and physiology, there's all sorts of classifications and as you look at them, okay, and, and like I said, I don't want to go through all of what I would teach in anatomy and physiology and all the construction parts of it, but what it has that's significant, it's got a lot of fibers. The more fibers that you have, okay, typically the less room for blood, the less room for oxygen. So element, when, the more fibers you have, we have a word for it, we call it dense rather than loose. They're closely packed. These are very resistant, and these are typically don't have a lot of blood supply and would be very resistant to the effects of radiation. That are there. The interesting part in the areas surrounding and in some of the looser tissues, you have a lot of these that are called blast cells. So the suffix we use in anatomy is we have what we call sites and blast site is mature and less active blasts are immature and very active they're the ones that are most susceptible. things like that they are part of the they become active when there's damage from what other other means whether physical or, or traumatic or chemical means they become active so what happens when you get a cut or something like that or a scrape of your skin chemicals are released the chemicals basically go part of the inflammatory process they activate cells that are in the site phase and basically convert them back to the blast phase and they start to get busy making new stuff because we don't repair so much as we replace and that's part of the things that you will see when we get into the terminology next time is the concept of regeneration okay it's really what we, what your, your principal repair process is. The distinction they make in the terminology in, in this field is regeneration is replacement of cells versus repair, which typically implies scar tissue. And that means cells don't, and that means the tissue doesn't function. Therein is the big problem. It's lack of functionality. So there's lots of different kinds of cells that are in there. White blood cells are interesting because they vary, they replicate very rapidly. The ones that are most susceptible outside of the bone marrow, lymphocytes, they all have different sort of replacement rates. And lymphocytes are pretty fast. I think that's the underlying feature that's not necessarily clearly understood that are there. And this is what it looks like. This is that loose areole or connective tissue. Lots and lots of blood vessels in that. So what you, which the largest thing you see in there is a capillary. And then all this, and this is all that space. So when you're injured and something swells up, it fills the air is replaced by water because fluids tend to extrude. Liquids tend to come out of the capillaries that are there and lots and lots of different cells. And they give you a whole thing. So the loose ones are the ones that are more impacted. So a real or tissue, fatty tissue, and fatty tissue starts to deteriorate. So the best example I can begin to give you of that is the, if we have a burn, the severity of the burn. So most of the time burns that we get are what we call first or second degree, called partial thickness. And what happens is they cause some isolated damage to the outside 
And sometimes they cause the layers to separate and they fill with fluid. We call it a blister. Those, they heal uneventfully. They're not necessarily pleasant, but they heal uneventfully for the most part, unless they're widespread. Third degree, which is called full thickness burns, goes through the full thickness. I'll show you the picture of the skin and the fatty tissues involved, and that's really significant. That's there. So it's a matter of the depth when we look at skin, but there's fatty tissue in a lot of places as well, but it's got a lot of blood supply, comparatively. Reticular is interesting because that's in lymph nodes. And one of the things, as I just mentioned it before, lymphomas, are, and we have lymph nodes everywhere. What a lymph node is, is a sort of a century where fluids that might have infection or cancer are carried by tiny blood vessels that are sort of friends of blood vessels and run with them called lymphatics. And they carry bacteria, viruses sometimes, cancer cells, damaged cells, and they go into these lymph nodes. And what happens in the lymph nodes is they basically, it's almost like, it's, it's almost like going through a strainer would be the analogy. So you have a lot, it's like a, a strainer at the bottom of a funnel. So you have a funnel where you have a lot of lymph coming in like this, and throughout it, there's little nooks and crannies. And what happens there is there, it's filled with lymphocytes. And again, those are very, very susceptible. So not only is that where the problems can sometimes develop, but also that's really one of the focus points when we treat them, like radiation. Most famous local example of having a damage, having throat damage from a treatment for a lymphoma with radiation is one uh, very prominent penguin, the Mario Lemieux. So back in 1993, the penguins had won their first two Stanley Cups, and right about eh, I'm going I'm going to tell you relatively early in the season. Or, or perhaps even in the preseason, he came up with a big announcement. There was a zillion people there, both the French press and, and the English press, where he announced, yeah, I, we had a family history of Hodgkin's. And he missed uh, surely the first half of the season. By the time he came back, Penguin still, and by the time he came back, he his really his major complaint was having a sore throat from, from the treatment, which is pretty much all radiation. Therapy was employed, at least at that time, you know, so much therapy years ago. Unfortunately, they came back at the end of the season by winning 17 games consecutively and lost to the Islanders. In the second round of the play. It's, 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 it's sad. They were, that was the best Penguins team. Well, the typical Tom Barrasso, right through the in overtime. So, just say, Joey Mullen's brother, playing for the Islanders, a couple of New York guys. Just say, okay. So, I mean, now as they get dense, less blood supply, less problem, very mature cells. So, the areola are all over the place fibroblasts, sensitive cells, loose fibers. Water can go in there. Lots of white blood cells are in there, all different types. Adipose, you don't see it quite as well, but there is a fair amount of blood supply. It's just obscured because the fat's somewhat opaque in there, so you can't really see through it. No, I mean, notice the surround, and, and, and again, it's one of the impactful points of breast cancers as well. And this is reticular. Those are the ones in the aforementioned lymph nodes that are there. They act like a strainer. They're very, very thin, delicate fibers, and the cells are sort of mounted in them. So we call it a mesh-like stroma. Those darker fibers are particular. Oh, those are lymphocytes. It's interesting where they're located. And then these are dense, and, and, and this is tendon and ligament, not a lot of blood vessels. The big, big thing about that, with regard to radiation, not sensitive. With regard to healing, almost impossible. So they all heal, they don't regenerate, they repair with scar tissue. And they're not nearly as functional. So when someone tears a ligament, a lot of times, depending on the severity of the damage, and maybe the most famous of these is the anterior cruciate ligament, you end up grafting in something. 
in order to replace that some other dense connective tissue to replace the ligament because they just don't eat. My middle child, my younger of the two boys had that when he was 16 or 17. They had to do a, a, an autograph. So they grafted material. It was part of his patellar tendon. It took the place of very, very similar material. The moral of the story is, is, is don't let your children become BMX bike riders. It's, you know, X game stuff. It's one of those. Now he's 37. He's fine. I've managed to get him to not do the jumps. Go figure. So that, and so we see this. These are the capsules, the enclosures like around the kidney. Very, very dense and thick. Very few blood vessels, just not as well organized. This is in an art, this is in the aorta. A lot of elastic fibers. Very, if it's damaged, scar, if it's damaged, big problem that are there. And there's not a lot going on with cartilage or bone per se. So as I go through these, really, I, 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 that's why I didn't necessarily load bone because the bone slides here are more of the outer, very solid area of the bone. And really, this is what we will look at, but not so much blood in the bloodstream. Really, the point of damage is located within the bone marrow. So I'll come and show you that. In a little bit and again muscle whether it's skeletal muscle cardiac muscle smooth muscle or nerve tissue is so densely packed with proteins it's, it's really very very resistant to any of these things densely packed again with proteins the blood there is a lot of blood supply here but the but the muscle itself is something that's just not typically unaffected and same with smooth muscle they're rarely affected and, and nervous tissue it's not the nerves it's these supporting cells. They are the problem. But they are, well, again, they are, those are the areas when you hear about brain cancer, it's not these cells that are affected. It's these cells that support it. Because they have regenerative properties. But it, 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 most of the time, uh, that treatment, uh, things that we quote unquote call brain tumors, because tumor it could be benign or malignant. Most of them are benign, and the trouble is you're in, you're, in a, you're in a closed space called skull. And when it grows, it squeezes the good stuff against the wall and damages it. So it's more of what we call space occupy. Um, okay. And I, I don't have a whole lot else to share with you about these. So I wanted to go through as many as I can, and if I don't catch them all, I'll pick the rest later. These, you know, and so let me X out of that, so to speak. And Let's see which ones look the most interesting. Okay. The area that's probably affected the most here, digestive. And I know uh, Dr. Buxton had this. This is the player where we see it, perhaps more so in the small and to a lesser extent, the large intestine than anywhere else. The big effects are here. And in the textbook, there are, even though they're in black and white, there are a number of slides that give you an idea of how these particular tissues are affected. So we have two types of indentations in the digestive area. In the stomach, we have what are called pits, P-I-T-S. Okay, And the pits are where lining cells are replaced and they generate stomach acid. And yeah, there's probably a certain amount of activity that goes in, but the stomach's a pretty uh, contained area. Okay, and really the whole idea of digestion to summarize it in a word, you're able to process your food efficiently because of surface area. The more surface area, the, be the better it is. But the, the stomach doesn't have a ton. The stomach doesn't do a lot of processing. The stomach's like a big mixing. Basically, the food goes in there and it churns in the middle of a bunch of acid. And the stomach's got a bunch of ridges in there. So it's like an old style washboard. Go down, maybe you have it in your basement, a utility sink that's got the little ridges in there. Yes, you know what I'm talking about? Somebody. In your washing machine, they have an agitator, right? Okay, you either have that thing, or, or the new ones like we have, have that thing in the bottom where there's ridges. Same idea, right? That's what your stomach does. It's a mixing bag. It's like in my house when I was born, we went down to this creek with the rocks, 
didn't. I grew up 20 miles from New York City. We had running water. We had indoor plumbing, I know. Very civilized. Please. Now I'm sure somebody is teaching you grow up on a farm someplace. Outdoor plumbing. Oh, it's great. It's a great anecdote. I, I practiced up in the northwestern Pennsylvania, the Oil City Franklin area for many years. And when we resided there, we went up to have dinner at an Amish family's home up in Spartansburg. In Spartansburg, there were only two things, an abundance of deer and Amish ones. Really good eats. No refrigeration, no electricity, no indoor plumbing, if you get my drift, no outdoor plumbing, just out of the house. Boy, what a, talk about goodies. It's very interesting. Have you ever been to one of those? Anybody? No. You see, they basically do a big dinner in two servings. The men and the children eat first. Men, men without getting into the, the social aspects of it, there's just, they function as a much as society based on older men. And the children, because they're hungry. And then the women and the, the older older girls who are able to, to assist with the food preparation. And I felt that that was good. So I ate twice. I sat with both. I'm just saying. Can picture it to this day. So, nevertheless, so much for that interesting. See, I have anecdotes. So, this is the area we're talking about. The small intestine is all about surface area. If you took the small intestine, which is a tube in most of us around 20 feet, 25 feet long, let's say 20 feet would be about average. And the diameter, let's say, is around an inch, inch and a half. And if you cut it, so if you took a garden hose that was an inch, yeah, which would be a big hose, okay, and sliced it and laid it out on the floor, you know, let's say it would be the length of this room, right? There's so much surface area in the intestine, it would occupy a tennis court if you stretched everything out, which gives you an idea of these structures called crypts, and they will show it to you in a minute. It's liver and things like that. Liver is less impacted. Again, it's an organ that's surrounded. So its impact is late. And this is what we see. It has a lot of these things that permit surface area. So it, it almost is like when the food passes, it doesn't go straight through the tube as you would like putting water in a hose. Okay. Or, you know, something in a straw going straight in and straight out. Effectively, it kind of goes in a circular pattern. Then you have all these little nooks and crannies that are there from these ridges, which are called, the fancy name is plica circularis, which means circular folds. And then there's little nubs on it that have surface area. So these are the nubs. And there are millions upon millions of these. Each of these little nubs, which are called villi for little faint for fingers, okay, contain, have a lot of blood supply. They always have blood supply and lymphatics within them. And the digestive process is around here. The area that's most susceptible are these. At the base of all of these fingers, here, 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 are what are called intestinal crypts. And in your textbook, they use the older term because there's a proper name associated with them called crypts of Lieberkuhn. So it's a proper name, whoever, you know, put that into the medical journals back in the 1800s. This is where the new cells are generated. The cells that we replace the most rapidly in the adult, we're talking about, about a, a, fe a fetal or embryonic, but the cells that are replicated the most rapidly in the greatest number are those, the lining cells of the entire stomach, small and large intestine. They're replaced in total every three to six days. The ones that are the fastest are right here. This is the area that's most susceptible and therefore creates the greatest problem with regard to its response to radiation acutely or initially. 
These are damages, a very good black and white illustration to show what they're like before and after and how they disappear. So they are everywhere. They're, it's in the name that we typically call them now are intestinal crypts. There's that brush border I was showing you a little bit before. It's everywhere. So those cells are also affected. They have enzymes in them that do two things. One, they break apart. They finally break apart all the nutrients. And then they assist in the movement either into and processing or into and through the cells directly into the bloodstream. Busy area. It's a big problem. People have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, all those things directly related to this. Those are really, those, to me, from what I, I, from having practiced for 25 years and having tons of patients with this, having undergone it and, and, you know, from studying it over the rest of the time that I've you know, been involved in the teaching aspect for another 20 years, the, this is the big problem. The gastrointestinal distress more than anything else. Skin. And I, I showed you, I went to the GI first before I went to the skin. I'll probably have to do that the next time. Skin plays a role, but I think it's more limited in the effects. It might be, depending on the intensity of the radiation exposure, you could have long-term damage. But initially, things like hair loss and burning or irritation, I think have been limited from whole body exposure to more limited aspects. You know, this, you know, being able to, to divide in the treatments and the replication. And part of that's why we divide the cycle with those lymphocytes and the white blood cells. And I didn't get to the bone marrow, but I'll try to show it to you next. But this is what they look like. All those cells. And then down here, as they get deeper into these little crypts, these are all where they're being replicated and replaced. So it's constantly busy. So that's probably a billion cells a day. Here's again what they look like up close. So... The, the, the name we give them, enteric means part of your alimentary canal, enterocytes, okay, absorption, intestinal juice, these are all things that allow us to process things. All the enzymes and the fluids that allow this process to occur, and everything in this area is sort of controlled by pH, by acid and base levels that are there. So you have these cells, cells that produce additional hormones, they act like little glands, defensive cells, all of these are affected. And most importantly, these cells that are at the base called stem cells, okay, every two to four days. And so I mean, if you crunch the numbers, I said it would be not un unreasonable to think that a billion of these every day are reproduced. And there's a lot of lymphatic tissue and glandular tissue that's associated with it. So here they talk about chemotherapy being a target, perhaps more so, okay, and rapidly dividing GI tract epithelium, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, but it's, it's not exclusive to that. That's there. And, and really that's the critical area. It's a little less problematic when you get into the large intestine. I'm trying to get through some of these slides because the anatomy is, is, is not quite, it doesn't have all those little nooks and crannies and regenerative cells. It's really a sort of a base lining when you get into the, the colon area. There's not a lot to it. It's larger. I think the walls are pretty much, are, are, there's less structure that's available. That's here. But it'll have some of the impact. But if you're wondering that your appendix is down here. It's over there. So uh, let me have just a couple of minutes and let me, so that was 22 if you're, you're keeping, keeping track. And then this one, blood fascinating area. Love it. So this is when we look at this, we're looking at blood cell, we look at a, we call it a peripheral smear. You can do this in the laboratory, maybe you did it in a micro. It's a lot of times a good way to look at eukaryotic cells and get used to using a microscope. So you can see red cells and they call these white cells, even though they're not white, but because they're not red, it's really where they got their name. And they look at all the things that happen to them, and that's the hemoglobin molecule. I'm trying to get to where we get to this, this concept of there's more red cells than anything else. They are more affected initially and long term by radiation because we end up with what's called, and this is the sort of the critical player. If you look deep inside bone in young people, okay, in children and young adults, 
And when I say that, probably all of us in this room have transitioned. Our blood formation is now in something called flat bones, your sternum, the upper portion of your hip, maybe skull bones, and a limited areas at the head area of the shoulder, the humerus, and the femur. That's about where your what we call red bone marrow is located. The long bones, the big bones like your femur and your tibia and your leg or the humerus here and the radius and ulna here are filled with fat. They're called yellow bone. Under extraordinary circumstances, they can transition. But what goes on in babies and in children up to when they hit bone maturity, let's say between 16 to 20, you have this. So you have red cell and white cell production, and it's all about these stem cells. And I'll show you what they look like. So this is what happens with the red cells. This was called, this is, this is the principal cell located in the bone marrow. It's called a hemato, it's pronounced hematopoietic stem cell called hemocytoblast. And as it matures, eventually becomes a red cell. Maturity means it doesn't, has only one function, carry oxygen. To do that, it sheds its nucleus and it sheds its sort of internal membrane structure that's there. So, uh, two million produced per second. So you can imagine, but they have a kind of a longer lifespan. So sometimes the results are not immediate, but long term. So, the, and if you look at the white cells, and I, I just wanted to buzz through that to show you the chart. And this is all about red cell dynamics and. I mean, if you'd like, I'll send you a, a, a recording of the lecture I'll be doing in the next couple of days on this. So email me if you want to hear more about it in that regard. So white blood cells, even more interesting because they have a multiple cell lines that are there. And wait, I'm looking for one particular slide, which I probably should have got before. But, and, and that's these, again, different kinds of, they all arise from that same cell line. So here was that original cell, the hemocytoblast. This is the illustration. So it breaks down into two cell lines, one that makes the lymphocytes, which these interestingly are the ones that are, seem to be the most impacted systemically initially by radiation. And so this, and these effectively are a kind of, this is a stem cell and so there's a lot of adverse effects that occur initially with this part of the cell line, long term with all of the cell line. So you get a reduction in these white blood cells. There's about a thousand times more red cells than white cells. So we don't, the loss of the red cells doesn't impact you as rapidly as the loss of the white cells. Loss of the white cells impacts you right away, and that's true for any of these interventions. And it's one of the things that you have to measure to be able to do radiation and chemotherapy. A lot of times they want to look at white cell levels to see if they're So I'll leave you with that for today. And I'll come back with, try to finish out these couple of other uh, types of tissues and where they're specifically impacted, like reproductive tissue, and show you a little bit of the lung, and then go into the terminal. So thank you very much.